Personally, I made the mistake of drinking coffee at two o'clock yesterday, and so I did not sleep at all last night, and I'm very tired, and this is decaf coffee, but we're just gonna take it chill and just kinda slowly roll into this lecture. Just have a good time, grab a beverage, sit down and relax. Let's enjoy our time here. If we're gonna have to spend an hour together, might as well enjoy it. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to take a look at the study terms that I have posted beneath this lecture and copy those terms onto either a Google Doc or a Word Doc or even print them out so you can write handwritten notes if that's what you prefer. And as you're listening and a term comes up, write down a couple sentences of what I said and what you need to remember about that term. Before I go any further, I want to explain a little bit about the dating system that we use. We operate on the BCE-CE dating system, and it can be a little confusing. So if you're already familiar with the BCE-CE dating system and you understand how it works, feel free to skip to this timestamp. Um, but if you would like to know a little bit more, I'm going to take a second to explain that. So the reason we do the BCE-CE is because in, I actually don't know when, but I think in the med medieval era in Europe, they decided to pick a start date for the calendar. We just gotta have this year zero. We just gotta pick one. And the biggest thing in medieval Europe was Christianity. And so they chose year zero to be Jesus Christ's birth. Um, we actually have done more archeological digging and we found out in more historical research Jesus was probably more born in 5 or 6 BC, BCE, um, so really that's what year zero should be, but we don't actually know. So we stick with year zero. That's why the year we're in the year 2022, because it was 2022 years after people thought Jesus was born. Really, it's more like 2,028 years after Jesus was born. I'm really bad at math, so if you ever see me pausing to do simple math like that, please don't judge me. BC stood for before Christ because year zero was Christ's birth. So before that is everything before Jesus. And then AD is confusing because it's in Latin and it stands for Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. So everything that happened after Jesus is the year of our Lord. So 700 AD is 700 Anno Domini, meaning 700 in the year of our Lord. To make it matters worse, now we don't use BC and AD because it's a little exclusive. Um, a lot of people aren't Christians and don't really want to always be thinking about whether something is before or after Jesus. Uh, but because the date of Jesus' birth is so set in our calendar, we couldn't suddenly change the year 2022 to be 10,076 because that's how long ago we know the earliest civilizations were. That would everyone, it'd be chaos, it'd be so confusing. So instead we've just changed the terms to be a little more inclusive. Um, so we now use BCE instead of BC. So BCE stands for before common era. And then we use CE instead of Anno Domini. So we use common era. So it honestly doesn't make sense. You just kind of have to get used to it. Um, and then the really tricky thing is everything before year zero, Jesus's birth goes down because it's counting backwards in time. You're, so the Mesopotamians were living around 3000 BCE and then you have the Egyptians, they lived from like 3000 to like 400 BCE and even beyond. And then you have, you know, Rome at 700 is founded and then the, the Peloponnesian War at 400 and then you have uh, the Qin Dynasty in 200 BCE. And so we're getting closer and closer to the year zero so the numbers are getting smaller. But then you hit year zero and the numbers start going up again. And that's when we have um, year 70, the temple falls in Jerusalem as the Romans conquer Israel or Jerusalem. Um, year 1000, the Vikings discover America. 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue. So the numbers go up after Jesus's birth. Now, another term I want to dig into a little more and explain is, and kind of re reshape the way we think about it, is the term Middle East. So Mesopotamia and somewhat part of Egypt, is part of what we consider today the Middle East. But that's really a terrible term for it. It was invented in the late 19th century as imperialism was at its peak and the European world dominators in Britain and France and the US were kind of developing a vision of the world 
they saw the world in relation to Europe. So everything was oriented to Europe, so especially the East. So they described the East in three sections in terms of their distance to Europe. So you had the Near East, that was Jerusalem and Samaria, Palestine, where the Holy Land is. That's the Near East. And then you have the Middle East, because it's in between the Near East and the Far East. The Middle East was all the other areas that we now kind of associate everything with the Middle East, but it would have been Afghanistan, um, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. Uh, all of that was Middle East. And then Far East was China, Korea, Japan. Those are the Far East regions. So you see this term is problematic. It's not a true geographic or historical term. Really geographically where this region is, is Southwest Asia. And so that's really the proper term for it. Um, a lot of people make the point that that doesn't quite capture this region very well because North Africa also uh, has a lot of similarities culturally and historically, religiously. Islam is pretty popular all across North Africa as well as Southwest Asia. So they like to group them all together when we're studying them, especially in history. And so people like to call it the region Southwest Asia and North Africa, or SWANA for short. Um, Swana sounds kind of funny, I don't know. I typically call the region Southwest Asia and then I'll mention North Africa as well. I may slip up and call it the Middle East every once in a while because it's so part of our culture's terminology. But for the sake of clarity, everyone knows what you're talking about when you say the Middle East, so there is some benefit to that. The big thing you need to know about all early civilizations is pretty much for the most part they originated around these river valleys. So in Mesopotamia that was the Tigris and the Euphrates. In Egypt that was the Nile. In India it was the Indus River Valley civilization. In China it was the Yellow River Valley. And even in Norte Chico there was a river valley in South America where a um, community developed there around the same time as these other communities. But today we're just going to be talking about Mesopotamia and Egypt, mostly because Mesopotamia was the earliest civilization that we know of on planet Earth. And by civilization we mean a group of people generally of a common heritage and linguistic background who live in the same place, who create cities and buildings together, and uh, there's generally a writing system. So with Mesopotamia, the real key thing to know is the rivers. You've got to understand the Tigris and the Euphrates if you're going to understand Mesopotamian culture. Because the Tigris and Euphrates were crazy. They flooded all the time and or very erratically. You could never really predict when flooding was going to happen. It was always devastating. It would wipe out crops and towns and people. Now with these unpredictable floods, there was a positive side in that so much of that flooding and the water distributing the, the silt and the um, minerals within the river, spreading that all across the land. This region is often referred to as the Fertile Crescent because the soil was incredibly rich and the crops that you, if you were able to harvest your crops without the flooding, they would be incredibly rich and inc incredibly abundant. Uh, the problem was that it was so unpredictable and there were lots of issues. Um, and then the other issue being that as much as this area was a very fertile place for crops, there wasn't a whole lot of other natural resources like uh, wood and timber for building. They're, they're missing a lot of the minerals and important natural resources um, that a society needs to thrive. And so they had to rely on trade with other uh, societies around them to survive. One of the ways that we're able to know what we know about the Mesopotamians and really any culture or society that has ever existed is based on the writings that they've left behind. They had these cuneiform tablets. That's what they left behind. Hundreds and thousands of these tablets. They are basically, um, it's like a clay tablet while it was, they would kind of create the tablet while it was still wet. They would take a sharp uh, stylus with a little, like kind of like an, it's almost like an exacto knife with a little wedge of a um, sharp end on the end of the stylus and they would use it as kind of a pen and they would cut into the clay tablet while it was still wet and create these messages. Um, they slowly over time built up a richer and richer vocabulary with um, different characters representing different concepts and they left tons of these behind because clay tablets are remarkably one of the most durable materials on planet earth. They last forever so they would carve these 
messages to each other on these tablets and then you know leave them somewhere or they would get buried in the sand and we found them thousands of years later almost perfectly still intact so it's an incredible way to keep a record of yourself write it on a clay tablet We've been able to learn from these cuneiform tablets what the religion of the Mesopotamian people was really like. Um, they were polytheistic, which means they believed in a whole pantheon of gods that were in charge of orchestrating and conducting the cosmos from rain and weather to fertility to um, sailing and travel to good health. There were gods who were responsible for th these things and if you prayed to them and offered sacrifices to them you might win their favor and you would be able to have a good harvest that year or have lots of children or become wealthy. Because of the way that Mesopotamian society was structured and it was so impacted by the you know, the weather and the flooding, um, the role of the gods in society was huge. For ancient Mesopotamians, the physical world and the spiritual world were intimately tied together. Like you had to appease the gods for society to continue. And so you needed someone to do the appeasing, going to the gods and appeasing them and getting all the good gifts for the people. And that person was the priest. Mesopotamian cities had their temples at the very center of the city and the rest of the city built out around from the temple because it was the central part of their society's functioning. One of the most popular styles of temple early on for Mesopotamians was a ziggurat, which was basically like a uh, vertically ascending temple structure on a stepped platform with the main temple on top. In one city in particular, the city of Uruk, there was a massive ziggurat and temple complex that was constructed around 3200 BCE to honor this fertility goddess, Inanna. And uh, scholars have calculated that its construction required probably the services of over 1500 laborers. So that tells us not only how important temples and the gods and priests, the role of priests were to Mesopotamians, but also just how organized and how efficient they were. That they were able to get control of the people and force them to do this kind of labor means they had significant government and administrative power over them, um, as well as military power. One of the most fascinating records left behind by the Mesopotamians is called the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's this incredible tale of this man named Gilgamesh who is this amazing, heroic, legendary hero of the city of Uruk and also its ruler. And in the story, Uruk has a dear friend named Enkidu. And Enkidu doesn't like the gods. He thinks it's unfair that the gods can be immortal and, and human beings aren't. So he does something to offend the gods and the gods punish him by killing him. And Gilgamesh is devastated. His best friend has just been killed and he, in his devastation, he tries to seek his own way to achieve immortality. And so he goes on this great quest. Gilgamesh eventually finds a plant that is able to uh, confer on him the gift of immortality, but a serpent steals it away and he's not able to take it. And so he has to accept his fate that he is mortal. And this is really what's so powerful about the Epic of Gilgamesh is it reflects the complexity of Mesopotamian society. So we've been talking about Mesopotamia as a whole. Mesopotamia is a name for a geographic region. It's not the name for a specific people group. There were lots of different people groups within the region of Mesopotamia. And one of the earliest ones was Sumeria. The most powerful and influential of the Sumerian city-states existed from about 2800 to 2300 BCE. The Sumerians have an amazing history. They had long dynastic traditions, epic wars, heroes, and battles, and some people dedicate their entire lives just to studying Sumerian culture. We don't have time to get into all of that. Uh, what I will say is there was one thing that the Sumerians practiced in terms of government that became very popular in the area, and that was the idea of a territorial state. They didn't create a formal empire. Instead, it was a this kind of territorial state in which um, they had regional control over a certain area, and they required tribute from surrounding regions for their protection and for um, to keep the peace in the area, but they did not have full centralized control over the region. That wouldn't come until the Akkadian states took over um, and defeated the Sumerians, um, and they were led by a man named Sargon the Great. Sargon the Great was the world's first emperor. He lived around 2300 BCE, and he was incredibly successful both as a conqueror and as a administrator of a government. And that you will see over and over again in this class, is that in order for kingdoms and empires to establish themselves, and not only to 
to conquer lands, but to continue to control them. They have to not only be good at winning battles, but good at governing. It's, it's essential. You'll see that especially with Persia. Um, you'll see the Athenians fail to do that. You'll see the Mongols do incredibly well at that. Um, this element of governance is huge for an emperor to really achieve their goals. And Sargon was incredibly great at it. He was able to set up strategic alliances and gain control of the whole region rather than just get tribute and, and kind of have these territorial states. For a time, the Akkadians were able to t keep control of Mesopotamia, but there was quite a lot of infighting and rebellion as well as invasions from outside. And by 2150, the Akkadian territorial state had collapsed altogether. But it would not be long before other conquerors would come along seeking the prosperity and the abundance and the wealth that the Akkadians and the Sumerians before them had been able to achieve. The next major conqueror in the Mesopotamian region were the Babylonians. And the most important figure within the Babylonians is a man named Hammurabi. Hammurabi is known for his creation of a system of law codes. He didn't write the laws themselves, but all of the Mesopotamian peoples had kind of followed a very rough smattering of different law codes that differed from different regions and everyone had different opinions on how things should be done. And he compiled all the law codes into one place, organized them, cataloged them for extensive use across his empire. Hammurabi's law code was the first of its kind. While there had been law codes before, no one had had this kind of centralized administration of a legal system. So that is Hammurabi's great contribution to world society, is the first legal system. One of the key features of Hammurabi's law code, he developed this concept of lex talionis. It's a Latin word that means law of retaliation. We actually get a specific phrase from this uh, law code, an eye for an eye, um, because in the, within the law, if you stabbed a man's eye out, your eye would be stabbed out as well. If your son is harmed when he's working on another man's field, then his son should get killed. If you stab someone, you should get stabbed. We don't rely on lex talionis anymore. We actually rely on common law, um, where things are decided in a court and you weigh evidence and you figure out what really happened and the judge decides what the punishment should be. But in ancient Mesopotamia, lex talionis worked really well. It created a lot of stability, but it was incredibly brutal. Um, and you can read a lot more about it um, in our readings for this week. In addition to his legal system, Hammurabi was incredible at centralized administration. He input the first real taxes uh, that the world had ever seen. Rather than just requesting tribute from his citizens and from regional areas, he required taxes from everyone, um, which you know, people resented, of course, and they still resent taxes to this day, but they also provide incredible stability because when you pay taxes, you're promised the protection and the stability that the king offers you. And so it was this trade-off that we'll give you this money that you require from us, and then you'll protect us and, and take care of us and make sure that the government continues to run, that trade continues to flow, that the crops continue to be harvested, things like that. After the Babylonians came the Assyrians, but we're not going to talk about them a ton because we just don't have time. Um, instead, I want to talk about a group called the Phoenicians, who were not within Mesopotamia proper. They were actually on the coast um, near modern-day Palestine. Uh, their capital was the city of Tyre, and they were incredibly important to the Mesopotamian region, as well as the Mediterranean region and later history that we'll learn about in week three. But the Phoenicians were, um, they were really restricted by their natural resources. They had a ton of cedar timber available to them, and that was pretty much it. So they had to figure out, how do we survive as a society if we don't have all the things we need, like crops and livestock and all these things that other societies have? So they traded heavily with the Mesopotamians, with the Egyptians, all along the coast of the Mediterranean. Um, and so they became master shipbuilders, master mariners, and they, they really got really good at maritime trade and all forms of trade. They were kind of the world's first businessmen. They were incredible traders, incredible merchants. Um, and the other thing that they're really known for is the creation of the alphabet. The very alphabet that we actually use in America today was pretty much created by the Phoenicians, which is just remarkable to think about that that's the one that we still use, but we do. Um, it was so, it was important to them because cuneiform was a great way to communicate with a small group of people who understood cuneiform, who knew all the characters and knew what they represented, 
but there were thousands of characters that was really hard to memorize and so not a lot of people were literate in cuneiform so what the phoenicians did is they created an alphabet where words could be strung together from letters rather than having to know all these characters you just knew the 20 letters or so that it was and you could create words from that and it was much easier easier to become literate so the phoenicians actually increased literacy in mesopotamia and the mediterranean region and they gave us our alphabet we're going to talk about two more Mesopotamian groups before we move on to Egypt. The first are the Hittites, and then the next will be the Hebrews, and we'll spend a little bit more time on the Hebrews. But the Hittites were important because they, while they didn't have a huge impact on the region, they, they had an empire for some time, and um, they were able to gain control for a while. Uh, their main influence is what they left behind. So the Hittites come from the Caucasus region in central Eurasia where horses are native. And so they learned to tame horses and learned how to ride them. And so they were, they were the first horse riding people in the world. After the wheel was invented, the Hittites were able to figure out how to put wheels behind a horse and make a chariot, which became like the version of a Mesopotamian tank. I mean, these things, I, the level of destruction that a chariot could cause on a battlefield is absolutely mind-blowing because we we see modern warfare today we see tanks and airplanes and all these insane you know machine guns and a, a chariot doesn't look that impressive compared to that but when all you have is guys on foot with not very good armor and then you have a full speed horse with a giant chariot with these heavy wheels coming at you. I mean, they would just kill people by trampling on them. Um, in addition to that, they learned how to shoot arrows from the chariots. And so they had this aerial warfare going on and it was devastating. The Hittites destroyed Mesopotamia. They were able to take over very quickly because their warfare was so advanced. However, Everybody else figured out how to ride horses and make chariots and they were taken over pretty quickly. But they were the ones who spread that technology throughout the region. And that was the dominant warfare style for hundreds of years. So the Hittites are pretty important. Um, in addition to that, the Hittites are connected to a group of people that spread all over Europe, Mesopotamia, and India, uh, the Indo-Aryan peoples. And we don't know a ton about them. We just know they came from somewhere in Central Eurasia. Um, they all had a similar linguistic style and they just kind of spread everywhere and brought their culture with them. So the ones who went to Europe became white people. The ones who went to Mesopotamia became the Hittites uh, and other people groups and they mixed and now it's, it's harder to distinguish the Indo-Aryans in Mesopotamia. But then they also migrated to India and in week four we'll be talking about how the Indo-Aryans came to India and brought the Vedic culture and actually had a huge impact on Indian culture. Um, so you might not think it just by looking at the two people, but Europeans have a ton in common with Indians, a certain, certain ethnic groups within India. There are lots of ethnic groups, um, but the, there are a certain group of ethnic people in India who are actually very closely ethnically related to Europeans. Who would have thought? Another people group who were not super important at the time that they existed in Mesopotamia in the time period that we're talking about, but are incredibly important to the course of world history are the Hebrew people. The Hebrews were a small tribe in Mesopotamia um, who gained a small amount of control in the area, um, but their huge impact was their religion. So the Hebrews are the ancestors of modern day Jews. Um, they were also called Israelites. They were the only people group at the time who believed in one God, not a whole pantheon of polytheism, monotheism. There's only one God. That's what the, the Hebrews belief system was based on. And he had revealed himself to the Hebrew people and given them a code of ethics and a way to live their life um, in what is called the Torah. Now from the Hebrews, uh, Jesus actually was born as, was a Jew, uh, was born into the Hebrew culture. Um, and Jesus is the founder of Christianity. In addition, to, so you have Christianity coming out of the Hebrews. In addition to that, Muhammad interacted heavily with both Jews and Christians, and he determined that they had not received the final revelation of who God was, but uh, the Christian and the Hebrew angel Gabriel visited Muhammad and gave him the final revelation of the God of um, the people of the book, as um, it, they're called in Islam, the final revelation came to Muhammad, and so the culmination of both the Hebrew, 
the Jewish and the Christian religions is in uh, Islam, according to Muslims. So from this one small tribe, pretty insignificant tribe, you have the three of the world's largest religions and that created huge impacts on history and society and culture. It's incredible. So they're important to know about. So what did they believe? We know they believed in one God, uh, but what was particular about this God is that he wasn't just requiring sacrifices and you better please me or else I'm gonna punish you. He actually wanted a personal relationship with his people. He offered them his steadfast love. He offered them um, connection to him, not just for the purpose of getting through life, but for experiencing spiritual fulfillment um, with connection to the creator. That was what the Hebrew God wanted with his people. In addition to that, the Hebrew God required high moral standards from the Hebrew people um, because it was important not just to uh, do the sacrifices and go through the rituals to please the gods, but to, to within your own soul, um, be a good person and to follow these morals and to live righteously. That was incredibly important to the Hebrew God as he revealed himself in the scriptures to Moses and to the Hebrew people. One of the most important documents or, or artifacts of the Hebrew people are the Ten Commandments that God is said to have given directly to Moses on Mount Sinai. They cover not only human behaviors like no stealing, no murder, don't commit adultery, um, don't lie, but they also require moral and religious behavior, honoring only the one God, not taking his name in vain, honoring the Sabbath, um, honoring your parents. These are the kinds of things that are in the Ten Commandments. They actually hang in the U.S. Supreme Court today and are considered a, a foundation of American law. Now that we've covered the Mesopotamians, we're going to jump over to Egypt. The Egyptians are incredibly interesting to study because we have so much material from them. They left behind so many records, um, the pyramids, the sphinx, um, the, some of their papyrus writings, and also all of the tombs that we've been able to discover. Something that's really unique about Egypt is that people didn't really know much about their culture until about a hundred years ago when some British archeologists went to Egypt and uncovered um, Tutankhamun's tomb. And then in addition to all the discoveries that have been made over the last century, um, there was the hugely important um, breakthrough of discovering the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was a block of stone. Um, I've actually visited it. It's it held in the British Museum in England, which is an issue all on its own, that it's in Britain and not in Egypt. Yay for imperialism. But what's on the stone is there are Egyptian hieroglyphics. Archaeologists had no idea what Egyptian hieroglyphics said. So there's a layer of Egyptian hieroglyphics and then right underneath it, it's written in another language from the region, I think Hebrew, and they all say the same thing. So we've been able to determine based on the two records that are copies of each other in different languages that the Egyptian hieroglyphs were in the same language as the other two items on the Rosetta Stone. And so we were able to decipher based off of the hieroglyphs what parts of those two other languages each hieroglyph corresponds to. And that's how we were able to crack the code of what the hieroglyphs mean. Egypt, you've got the Nile River, which is super low key. It floods very regularly every year at the same time across the same fields and deltas. And what that created was a culture where the, the Egyptian people, they barely had to do anything. They could just kind of throw some seed on the ground. Some cattle would walk along and trample it into the soil and then boom crops like crazy. And so the culture that grew up in Egypt was much more relaxed. The gods were much more on their side. Um, the people expected abundance. They received abundance. They were very wealthy. And as a result of that, they had an incredibly rich culture and architecture and religious system, all because they had the prosperity and the wealth from which to build off of. Around 3100 BCE, a man named Menes, M-E-N-E-S, was able to bring Egypt into a giant unified state. And he pronounced himself the pharaoh of these peoples. Even from the earliest pharaohs, including Menes, uh, pharaohs were considered to be gods living on earth among the people. Egyptians associated the early pharaohs with the sky god Horus, and they represented the pharaohs together with a falcon and a hawk, which were the symbols of Horus. 
But that actually changed later and pharaohs became associated with the god Amun, the sun god, and pharaoh became known as the son of the sun. They considered the pharaoh a human sun, S-U-N, um, shining and ruling over the human realm just as Ammon shined and ruled over the cosmic realm. So Egyptians history is roughly divided along three major sections, periods called kingdoms, and between those are little intermediary periods, which we're just gonna skip there, you could read them on your own time, but we're gonna just talk a little bit about what made the old kingdom distinct and what made the new kingdom distinct. The old kingdom lasted from about 2600 to about 2100 BCE, and it was most defined by its massive pyramids. That's what the old kingdom's known for. Old kingdom, pyramids. No other kingdoms built pyramids. The ones that you see today are five thousand years old. We are actually closer in time to Cleopatra than Cleopatra was to the building of the pyramids. That kind of gives you an idea of just how massive the civilization of Egypt was and how long it lasted. The enormous pyramids as well as the sphinx um, and much of the royal tombs of the ancient pharaohs of the old kingdom stand today at Giza which is near Cairo in Egypt and they are just this amazing testimony to the pharaoh's ability to marshal Egyptian resources and build these incredible monuments that took so much work, so much effort, and just shows you the wealth and the grandeur and the sophistication of the Egyptian people. The New Kingdom is really known for much of what you probably associate with Egypt. So we're talking hieroglyphs, mummification, not pyramids though. Pyramids are Old Kingdom. New Kingdom is mummification and hieroglyph. As in Mesopotamia, the ancient Egyptian way of writing was pictographic, so just as cuneiform was these images carved into stone, the Egyptians used images in the form of hieroglyphs to communicate ideas. The word hieroglyph is actually a Greek word, and we get it as a result of Hellenization that we're going to be talking about in week three. Um, the Greeks came and they saw all these amazing inscriptions from the Egyptians and they mostly saw them on temples and other religious structures and so they associated them with holy writing. And so hieroglyph is actually Greek for holy inscription. Hieroglyphic writing can be found all over Egyptian architecture as well as on the papyrus um, that they left behind. Papyrus was a form of early paper made from the insides of the papyrus reed along the Nile River. The hot and dry arid climate of Egypt has been able to preserve thousands of these papyrus writings and so we've been able to learn more about Egyptian culture from what they left behind in the papyrus. In addition to the preservation of sheets of papyrus, because of the arid climate in Egypt, the Egyptians mummified dead have survived thousands of years and we've been able to study them and learn more about their culture from that. To understand mummification as well as the pyramids and Egyptian burial, you need to understand their religious system. So the Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife and they also believed that the, the physical body uh, would live on in the afterlife as the kind of the vessel for the soul. And so they were so, it was so important to preserve the physical body to allow for the best possible afterlife. And so that's why they did mummification. They would pull out the organs through your nose or through small, small parts of your body um, to try to preserve the physical body as much as possible. Stuff you full of, of chemicals and preservatives and then wrap you in these linen sheets um, to keep the body as intact as possible. In addition to preserving your body, there was important to be buried along with the items and sometimes the people that you wanted with you in the afterlife. Um, so that's why Pharaoh's tombs are often filled with treasures and riches and food and mummified animals and their wives and their children sometimes because they wanted these people with them in death. Early on mummification was just reserved for the pharaohs because it was such an intense and expensive process. Later on as the Egyptian civilization became more wealthy, more and more people had the resources to be able to mummify themselves after they died. And so you saw more and more of the nobility and the upper classes and even some middle class Egyptians mummifying their dead. The Old Kingdom pharaohs used the pyramids as their own tombs. They spent their entire lifetimes building these grand, beautiful tombs. But later pharaohs learned that those are pretty much billboards for, hey, come rob me, I have immense riches and wealth buried within. And so tomb robbers would come and they would raid the 
raid the pyramids like crazy. And they actually believe that the people who are in charge of guarding the royal tombs and guarding the pyramids told the tomb robbers how to get in and they pay, they were paid off and they got part of the profit. So there was some internal corruption that led to that. So later pharaohs and later Egyptian kings learned to bury their dead in a much safer place. Out deep in the desert, they would, un they would not mark the tombs. They didn't want tomb raiders to be able to find them. They still found them, again, most likely because of internal corruption. So today we looked at Mesopotamia, um, the origin of societies, the importance of rivers. Uh, we looked at the Sumerian city-states, the Akkadians. We looked at the Babylonians, the Hebrews, the Hittites, the Phoenicians, and finally we finished with the Egyptians. There is a lecture quiz that you'll need to take after you've watched this. It's due on Friday of this week, March 3rd. Every other lecture quiz that you will need to complete will be due on Tuesday. So this week is an exception because we started on Monday and wanted to give you enough time to be able to finish everything by the end of the week. Um, but next week, the lecture quiz will be due Tuesday. In addition to the lecture quiz, you'll be looking at some primary source readings from ancient Mesopotamia. You'll be reading some Hebrew literature. You'll be reading uh, about the Code of Hammurabi, about warfare in ancient Mesopotamia. I think it's all very fascinating. I hope you enjoy it as well, and I hope you learn a little more. Don't forget to post your reading comprehension questions after you have finished doing the reading. And I think that's all you have to do for this week. Um, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.